Let's pray. Father, we come to this moment where you, Lord, have invited us to be in your presence, to be taught, and to learn. You've drawn us away, Lord, from our homes and our busyness and the things that we perhaps could have done, but now, Lord, we find ourselves in the church. And that, Lord, we have come because we believe you have something to say to us. And so, Lord, as we come into your presence, we pray, Lord, that you will remove any form of distractions. Maybe our mind is already into next week of what needs to be done. Or maybe there are things that have happened in our homes that are troubling. Maybe our soul is unsettled for one reason or another. Maybe, Lord, we don't feel deserve, deserving to be here for one reason or another. And we don't know, Lord. And so, Lord, we, in, we invite the presence of your Spirit to come and speak to your people, to come and teach us, to open our eyes to see, and, and that, Lord, what you would like us to be and to be changed into, may that happen, Lord, through the grace and the mercy of Jesus. As we have talked about today, Lord, the love of God is way beyond what we can even think or imagine. And your grace is sufficient for us and your faithfulness is new every morning. So come, Lord Jesus, and speak to your people. In your name we pray. Amen. Allow me this morning to come close to you. And uh, I feel better about myself when I do that, so... I want to speak this morning from 2 Samuel chapter 9. Okay, 2 Samuel is in the Old Testament, and we'll read the text together. And as we read the text together, you will notice one thing, right? Today, as we do the testimony about thanksgiving, everybody said, you know, I'm thankful to God for this. Right? There are things that God has done in our lives that really touch us, then, then we now want to say it. We say, thank you, God. But in this text, in this text, it's totally different. The kindness of God towards this man that we'll talk about was so huge, so real, and so overwhelming. Maybe that's the word, right? It was so overwhelming that he, when we read the text, you will notice that he could not say thank you, right? He did not say thank you. It was overwhelming to him. Right? And I want us this morning, I want to invite us this morning to, to kind of think about that, right? Because thankfulness for us sometimes is only directed towards God because of his goodness towards us, right? Predominantly, that's what we do. So when we live today, after you know, we'll have a meal, and then you go to your own homes, and the family gathers and friends, then we'll pray and we'll say, thank you, Lord, for this. But I want to suggest that sometimes our thankfulness to God ends there. Right? We have received this wonderful kindness from God. His love towards us, His provision, His care, His healing, His restoration of families. It, it comes to us and we turn back to God and we say thank you. But often, I may suggest, sometimes that's where it ends. Right? We don't often extend the kindness of God towards us in a way that overwhelms people that they are left speech speechless. And that's the story we'll read today. And I want us to, to deliberate and think in our head, what kind of kindness can I show to someone that would just leave them amazed and speechless? Because that, my friends, is what God has done for you and for me. So that's the synopsis of where we're going. So let's read the text. So in 2 Samuel chapter 9, David asked, right? David asked. And that's the question he asked. 
Is there anyone still left in the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? I was wondering, when you're going to have a meal today, how many of us would pause and ask, is there anyone in my family? Is there anyone in my workplace? Is there anyone in my church? Is there anyone among my friends? Is there anyone in my community that I can show kindness to? Second verse. Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned him, so David is king, right? So he has servants. So they summoned him to appear before David. And the king said to him, are you Ziba? Right? Are you the servant? At your servant, at your service, he replied. The king asked, is there, is there no one still alive from the house of Saul? Saul is, is the previous king. He died, right? So David is asking, is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show, the word comes again, kindness, right? Kindness. Ziba answered, they still the son of Jonathan. Jonathan is Saul's son, right? Son of Jonathan, and he is lame in both feet, right? Very important description about the young man, Jonathan. I'd imagine if Jonathan comes this morning to church. And he's lame. Right? In the current context, he might be coming in a wheelchair. Right? In those olden days, I don't know how they, they probably carried him. Right? So he's lame on both feet. And the king asked, right? David asked, very important, he asked, where is he? The king answered, the king asked, Ziba answered, he is, the, he is at the house of Machir, son of Amiel, in Lodibar. Okay? This is the former king's son, grandson. Right? He should have inheritance. But notice, he's living in somebody else's houses, which shows, like, socially where he's at, economically where he's at. Right? The, the, the name of the city, Amiel, in Lodibar. Lodibar in Hebrew means no pasture. No place to plant, no place to raise, no place that you can support yourself. It's dry, it's desolate. And this man, who is the former grandson of the king of Israel, is somewhere in Lodibar. Right? Very important that we understand. That's the picture. Okay? So King David, right? King David brought him from Lodibar. He's living way out in the middle of nowhere in this kingdom. And the king said to him, bring him. Right? This lame young man who is broke, probably doesn't have much. And the king said to him, bring him. So the king had him brought from Lodibar, a place of no pasture, desolate, dry, from the house of Makir, son of Amiel, in verse 6, when Mephibosheth, can you say that please? Faster, faster. <laughs> Mephibosheth, right? These guys are not talking, can you say? <laughs> so when Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, right? that's a very important, like I, I've tried to understand that. He bowed down to pay him honor. How does a man who is lame bow down, people? I think about it. He could not stand. He's lame. When they brought him, they probably put it down, and all he did was lay down. Maybe that's how he expressed honor and respect for Saul. David said, Mephibosheth. Did you notice that? Mephibosheth. He didn't ask with a question, right? Mephibosheth? Are you Mephibosheth? Right? That's not what he said. He said, Mephibosheth. Right? Very assertive and in exclamation, Mephibosheth. It's almost like, good to see you, my buddy. Right? That's how he did it, right? And, uh, and David, and at your service, Mephibosheth replied. And David said to him, do not be afraid. Right? David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness. Third time. Kindness. 
right? For I will surely show kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore all to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul. Where was he living? Lodibar. No pasture. Nothing. And this is what the king said to him, I will give you back all the land that belonged to your King Saul, your grandfather. And that, that verse at the end, what does it say? Can we read it together? You will always... Can we... Oh, come on, guys, we can do better than that. You will always... You will always eat at my table. Are you getting the picture, people? Right? You will always eat at my table. Not only sometime, not only Thanksgiving, not only at the weekend, not only at Christmas, no, no. Matthew Baseth, you will always eat at my table. Verse 8. This is the question, my friends. Right? Matthew Baseth does not know how to handle the graciousness and the kindness of the king. He could not say thank you. He couldn't. And what does he do? This is his response, right? He bowed down and he said, what is your servant? That you should notice, not a dog, but a dead dog like me. Right? He could not even say, oh king, Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your graciousness. Thank you for your goodness. May God bless you and give you rule and reign forever and ever. No. No. Right? He was so overwhelmed with the kindness of God that that's all his response. He said, Why, what is your servant? Right? What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? What that means, my friend, is saying, what is your servant that you should notice? An undeserving, unworthy, right? Probably poor, wretched man that I am. Why would you even think about me, O king? I'm just a dead dog. Unworthy, undeserving to be in your presence. Right? What did David say to him? The dead dog from now on is always eating at my table. Right? Verse 9. Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, or the guy that the servant to King Saul before, said to him, I have given, so you ordered the servant to come, and he said to the servant of Saul, the king before, and said, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. Right? In verse 10. You guys there? Okay. And you and your sons, right? So he said to him, you, you look after him. I've given him the land. Then he says to you, you Ziba and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him. And bring him crop, bring in crops so that Mephibosheth, the grandson, may be provided for. Right? So you see the graciousness of the king. Does not only invite him to the table. Does not only restore that. But he said, you said to the, to the former servant, you come, bring your son and your servants. This is the land, you work it. So this man, who is lame on both feet, may be provided for. Right? As long as you live, this is what you do. So this man is provided for. Right? And Mephibosheth, the grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. How many times we've read, eat at your table now? Two. Right? Two. Kindness three times, eat your table at your table, right? So next one, next verse. Then Ziba said to the king, your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands to do. So maybe was at eight at David's table like one of, one of the king's sons, right? You get the picture, my friends. The lame, the dead dog, the undeserving, the cast, cast, cast away, the disfavored, now he's sitting at the king's table, treated like a king's son. Right? You get the picture? Right? No wonder he's saying, who am I, what am I, that you would look upon me with such favor. Right? 
Then Ziba, Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah, and all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. Okay, verse 13. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem. Ha! Right? Change of location. He was in Lodibar. Now he's moved to an apartment in Jerusalem, the city of God. Right? That's a huge promotion. Right? And he's eating at the, kid's ta in the king's table. Right? The third time, he was lame on both feet. Right? It, twice he talks about he was lame at both feet to remind us of his condition. So my friends, this morning, I want to invite us. And I want to invite you to ask yourself, ask the question, what is God trying to say to us? If we're going to be people like David, that have this extraordinary kindness that God has given to him, because God had shown him so much kindness, that in verse 3, David said, where is this son? Is there anybody alive from King Saul? So I may show him God's kindness or the kindness that God had shown me. Right? So I want to invite you to reflect on that. If God is inviting us and asking us this morning, how can we be a people that extends the grace, the kindness of God in such a way that makes them speechless in the sense that they couldn't even say thank you because they're so overwhelmed with the kindness of God. What are some of the things that I think we need to consider? There are four things that I want us to look at, and let me go through it very quickly. Right? Um, can, you, can you go back to the title there, Penny? I've, I've titled the, the message, uh, The Overwhelming Kindness of God. Right? Because I was thinking about putting living, right, or embodying the overwhelming kindness of God that makes us speechless, that makes people who are recipient of our kindness just speechless. That's the whole title. But I think for the sake of it's too long, you might forget it. So we just say the overwhelming kindness of God. But I want, I want us to think about how do I, if God is inviting you and inviting us, the question is, how do I embody this overwhelming kindness of God that makes people just feel like I couldn't even say anything? Okay? There are four things. First one. Right? Right? We need to pause and reflect on the kindness of God in our lives. Right? That's the first thing that I think we need to think about. You see, when we come to this text, right, when 2 Samuel chapter 9 opened, all of a sudden David asked the question, right? I didn't go to the previous text, just to read you very briefly, at the end of 2 Samuel chapter 8, this is what it said. And David had become famous, right? And he returned from striking down 18,000 Edomites in the Valley of Saul. So he had become famous. His reputation is now all over the region. Right? And later on he said, then, the Lord gave David victory wherever he went. Right? And David ruled over Israel doing what was just and right. And he talks about his kingdom. So when you look at David's life before chapter 9, right, his kingdom is settled. Wherever he went, right, God gave him victory. Imagine that. No kingdom, no king, no army can take on King David's king. He, he was given victory. His reputation began to grow. grow. And, and even in his kingdom, it's beginning to settle and it has become prosperous. Right? Let me, let me do some application. Today we'll have a meal. You go home and you already have a meal in your head on what you're going to eat. But let me make a guess. Most of us in this room are not having toast and eggs for Thanksgiving meal, right? Most of us would probably think that's not going to work. Unless you're sick and the doctor's giving you a diet, that's probably... But most of us won't, right? Most of us will have ham, chicken, whatever. It'll be a nice meal, right? Because the nice meal in our subconscious mind, when it's served, we're kind of thinking we're doing well. Things are secure. Things are stable. There's money in the account. 
I'm not worried about things. But if you eat toast and eggs, something is wrong. Right? Just in a subconscious, that's how I would think. Right? But sometimes people, in, in that moment when we're eating and wondering, right, we don't pause like David did. He was doing very well. Right? The, the, the kingdom, the, the, the relationships, foreign with other countries as well. He was thriving. And it's amazing to me that a person is thriving, doing so well, would pause. And ask the question, as we said in verse 1, is there anyone that I can show kindness to? Right? He was doing well. And most of the time for us, like I said before, we eat, we feel satisfied, and we move on in life. We never pause to ask, is there anyone that I can show kindness to? Maybe there's someone in your family that relationship needs to be mended. Maybe there's someone that you've heard that has grown distance. Maybe there's someone that you know that's been, right, that you see and you're not drawn to that person and something needs to happen. Maybe I would ask that today when you have a meal, maybe you can buy quiet, bow quietly and ask the Lord, Lord, is there someone that I can show kindness to? Right? And not only, not only for this Thanksgiving, but for the rest of the year. Who is someone that you can show kindness? And you see, kindness happened four times, right? <coughs> In the text that we read, right? Four times it talks about this kindness. And kindness is not about just being nice, right? Kindness is talking about reconciling people. Kindness talks about restoring what's been lost. Kindness is it's about being selfless in our giving. Kindness is about forgiveness. Kindness is about doing right. right? It's a whole word that is factored into this thing called kindness. It's not just helping a person once, it's more than that. Right? So when we're talking about kindness to somebody, it's about looking at somebody in a holistic way and asking the question, who is there that I can show kindness to? The second point, right? So pause this morning, this afternoon as we eat, reflect, right? And, uh, and think about, is there somebody that I can show kindness to? The second point that I want us to look at today is talking about practice authentic hospitality, right? And in, in, in kind of a closed setting, right? I told you the picture about Mephibosheth. Right? Mophibosheth is lame. Mophibosheth is the grandson of the former king. And in those days, if the, when the new regime changed in the kingdom, when this dynast, dynasty comes in, the former family just flee or they are killed. They're done with. Because the fear is that if they're around, they can cause stability. And that's why you find Mephibosheth in Lodibar. He's hiding. Right? He's hiding. He doesn't want King David to know that he's alive. Because his very presence is a threat to the kingdom. Presumed threat to the kingdom. Right? So that's why he's hiding. Right? He doesn't have much. He's lame. He's unproductive. Right? He doesn't feel like he deserves anything. He probably feels rejection. The whole system has put him away. Right? And I talked a little bit as, we, as, we, as I introduced this. The amazing way David welcomed him. Right? The first thing that David said to Mephibosheth, the second thing he said, do not be afraid. Right? You are safe here, Mephibosheth. But there's a point that I want to make, my friends. Right? I said authentic hospitality, a welcoming a welcoming that does not prejudge people. See, Mophibosheth said, he didn't say, who am I? He said, what am I? What is he saying? He's saying, I am lame. I am broken. I am a reject of society. I am undeserving. I am the disfavored one. Right? That's how Mephibosheth looks at himself. And my friends, that's how often we look at others. And that's why authentic hospitality becomes hard. 
Because we look at people and we categorize people and we put them there. See, Mephibosheth said, what am I that the king would take notice of a dead dog like me? Right? Mephibosheth was so overwhelmed because no longer he sees David looking at him as a failure. No longer David looks at him as a reject, as a disfavored, as a lamb, as an, uh, a lame or unproductive. David did not look at him that way. But my friends, that's how often we look at people and we categorize them. And the wondrous thing, wonderful thing about David is David welcomes him. Right? He brought him close. Right? He moved him from no low debar, no pasture, to the king's palace, to the table. He didn't even say to him, when you come, you eat with the cooks. You sleep on the floor there. I'm honoring my deal with your dad. No. He said, you come, you eat at the table with me. Right? There's an authentic sense of hospitality and a welcoming friends. Not only a welcoming, but a sense of acceptance. Please, my friends, I, I want us to think about this. I want you to think about this. Because this is who we are. It's not often. We look at people and we fear them. We look at people and we could not invite them because we are anxious of being close to them. Right? We look at people and we say, I don't want to be seen with that person because my friends will think, what am I doing? Right? That's the truth, my friends. Like, I can go specific. Right? Some people look at a black body like mine and they say black body symbolizes violence. Right? Some people look at First Nations that they think that they're unproductive, lazy, and drunks. People look at white people and they think they're privileged. You see what I'm, saying, what I'm saying? How do we as a church welcome people and love them with such kindness that it would make their mouth drop, jaw drop? That's what this is about, my friends. Right? An authentic sense of welcoming and acceptance. David did not see the lameness. Right? He did not see the disability that would separate him from Mephibosheth. He did not see that. Right? And you see, my friends, that I think is key. Sometimes we see people and we categorize them and we class them and makes it hard for us, for them, to, for us to invite them into our table. Right? That is an amazing thing. Four times, four times, my friends, right? that David said to him, you will always eat at my table. The lame, right, the rejected, the disfavored, right, the person that feels like a failure all the time is now considered a king's son. Think about that. Think about that, my friends. Right? So loved, so cared for, so cherished that this lame man who's been hiding for years and years has found himself in the presence of the king, eating there, always, always. You know, last week, we had the Lord's Supper in this church. Right? Jesus said, the Bible says, that he took the bread and blessed it, gave thanks. Then he broke it and gave it away and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. You see, you see my friends, that's the kindness of God. That's the kindness of God. That he took his only son and gave it to us. So that we might have life. So that you and I can eat at the table. Right? You and I can eat at the table. So I beg you today, think and pray. Ask the Lord. Lord, I invite you to come and search my heart. Who is the person that I may show the kindness of God to? Maybe it's somebody that you've never thought. Maybe there's somebody that you have categorized and put in a box and just put them away. Who is the person that God might reveal to you? That you would show such kindness 
that they would say, what am I? Why would you take notice of a failure like me? Why would you take notice as a reject like me? Why would you take notice of somebody that is so undeserving? Why would you take notice of a pride and arrogant man or woman like me? But that we would show kindness, my friend. Thirdly, right? Thirdly, David did something, right? Right, he said in verse 7, I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore, right? That's the word, restore. Right, restore all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul, and you always eat at my table. Right? I use the word rectify. It's kind of a, not a fancy word, but it's just a simple word. What rectify means is to make it right. Right? Make things right. Make things right. See, King David has now become king. But he made a vow with Jonathan because Jonathan had kind of saved his life. And they made an agreement. And, king, and Jonathan said to him, when you become king, I want you to show, always show kindness to my family and not harm them. And David said, yes, I will. Right? That conversation only happened between the two. There's no one listening into that conversation. Nobody's ever written. Like what we do today, we sign a covenant, an agreement with a lawyer. There was no lawyer. There was no one to witness it. That was between them. And you see, David could have forgotten that. Or he could have purposefully said, you know, why should I care for it? He's gone. Nobody knows. It's just me and Jonathan. Right? But he did the right thing. He knew what he had said. He knew the commitment that he had made to his friends. And he could not live with himself without at least asking the question, is there anyone in Saul's family that I can show kindness to? Right? He could have forgotten it. He could have just swept it under the carpet and lived happily ever after. But he didn't, my friends. Right? He didn't. So I think when we come to this point in our lives, when we're trying to invite people to be involved in that, maybe it's a relationship that you have, make things right. Do your best to make things right. You know what you have said. You know what you have done. You know what's causing the strain. You know, maybe your heart is not right with people. But we've got to work in making things right. That's what rectify means. And when we make things right, right, we try and restore. Right? Bring back the relationship to what it was before. Or bring back the relationship to how God would want it to be. Right? David restored, gave back the land. I mean, he was the former king. That must be a lot of land. But it didn't matter to him. Right? Maybe he did not tax Mephibosheth. In fact, the coffers of the, of the kingdom. It didn't matter to him. He could come up with many reasons of not making things right. Or maybe dealing shadily with the restoration process. But he didn't, my friends. He did not. Right? Remember, when we're going to build relationship with people, we work hard in making things right. And try our best to do the restoration, right? Settle things in a way that pleases God. And lastly, my friends, right? Practice the kindness of God. What David did for me before that, God does for us on a daily basis. Daily basis, my friends. You and me were like Mephibosheth, hiding, right? We all know that. We were hiding from God. Don't want God to know us. But yet God reach out, send his son so that we might come to know him. We were hiding just like Mephibosheth because we do not know how much the king loves us. So we were hiding because we think the king, Jesus, God, all he does is angry at me. Maybe he will punish me. That's how we think. Right? Mephibosheth is me, it's you, it's us. We were hiding. Right? 
Mephibosheth experienced and encountered the amazing kindness of God. Amazing kindness of God. Right? Being accepted, being welcomed. The prodigal son. Remember the story? Came to his dad and he said to his dad, Dad, I'm not even worthy to be called your son. Just let me hang out with the slaves outside. I'll just work for you. What did the father said? Right? You are lost, now you're found. You're dead, now you're alive. Clothe him, put on robes, ring in his finger, shoes on his feet, make the party. My son is here, now let's celebrate. See, Murphy Boseth is us. We don't know even how much God loves us and cares for us. Right? We are like Mephibosheth in the way that we look at David and we see how Jesus, how God gave Jesus as a bridge to bridge us, to bring us closer. That we might find hope and find life in him. That we can experience his abundance. Like we shared today, all of you can share about the goodness of God in you. That is the result of the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. So as we go today, being thanksgiving, I want us to take time, right, just to ask a question. What am I? What am I, Lord, that you would show such kindness to me? And the second question, who can I show kindness to? If God has blessed you, if God has been good to you, and he's been good to all of us, my friends, then at least we can say to him, God, Without this, I am absolutely nothing. You have elevated me. You have shown kindness to me. You have given me your son. You have given me life. All that I have, everything that I have comes from you. Who am I that I would deserve this? And second question, who can I show kindness to? Show kindness to in a way that makes their jaw dropped. Because the overwhelming love of God that you have felt, that I have felt, comes through us to them, unreservedly, dripping with God's grace and mercy and goodness. Maybe that's something we need to think about. Not only for Thanksgiving, my friends, maybe in the years to come, that we would have somebody and people that we can say to them, you will always eat at my table. Let's pray. Father, words seems uh, seems hollow when we think about the amazing love of God towards us. We cannot even think or imagine, Lord, to, to grasp the reality that Mephibosheth is us. We are lame and plagued by our own brokenness, Lord. We look at people and we prejudge them. We have ideas of not welcoming them, but of pushing them, of keeping them in their place. And yet when we look at the cross, when we listen to Jesus' words, we hear these words, come, come to me. This is who you are, Lord. And so, Lord, I pray for our congregation. Help us, Lord. Fill us, O Lord, with the kindness of Jesus. Make us be a people, Lord, that is so gentle and kind. That in our communication with people, in our relationship with people, that the love of God will just ooze out of us. That they would pause and say, what am I that you would care for? And today, Lord, as we pray quietly, perhaps, show us, Lord, 
who can we show kindness to? The kindness that makes people speechless. The kindness that makes people feel so deeply valued and be transformed because of the power of the kindness and the love of Jesus himself. And Lord, I pray this morning, maybe there are those in our congregation this morning that has not felt that kind of kindness and love of God. We pray for them this morning, Lord, that you just fill them with the love of Jesus. Fill them with the love of Jesus. And Lord, may your people, may your children that are gathered here hear the words that today I will show you kindness because of Jesus. Show your children, Lord, the kindness of God. Peel back any things that are blocking our eyes, maybe hardening our hearts. Peel it back. Break it, Lord. And may the people this morning hear that today you will see the kindness of God. Fill them, Lord, with hope and joy. And the goodness of God beginning today and the days to come. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' most wonderful name. Amen. Please let us stand as we close with this.